Well, dear students and friends of Wheaton College, we are so glad to be here together today. Uh, before we begin, I want to provide a little bit of context as to what we're doing today and tomorrow and Friday morning in chapel. Uh, as, you, as you now know, uh, this year we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation at Wheaton College. And our, yeah, give it up for the reformers. And we've, we've chosen Romans chapter 1, 16 to 17 as our year verse, which is about the gospel as the power of God. And our hope throughout the entire year is to rethink the implications of this gospel. Because the Reformation was, if anything, a gospel recovery movement. So we want to find out this year what the implications of the gospel are for every sphere of life. Last Friday, we talked about the gospel and suffering and the untimely death of one of our students. And today and tomorrow and Friday, we will talk about the implications of the gospel for racism, racism in America and black evangelicals. And this is what we'll talk about these next three days. And our hope is this that if the gospel is truly the animating principle of Wheaton College, and if it, is, if it is really going to be at the center of Wheaton's intellectual enterprise, we need to think carefully about what it means for us in 2017 to be people who love the gospel, who live in light of the gospel, whose lives are formed and shaped by it. So that's a bit of the, the, the context. And one of the things that that means is that we will, we hope to integrate this uh, robust doctrine and vibrant spirituality as well as, as well as a full engagement in ministries of justice and mercy. These next three days, particularly, we want to see the gospel implications for racial inequality for systemic racism, and particularly racism as an, as an ideology, as a belief system, an idolatrous one, a wicked one to be sure. Mm -hmm. But we will see that it is indeed a, a belief system. Uh, so in every possible way, we are presenting this as a gospel issue. Now, earlier this year, uh, Dr. Uh, Rich Mao, the president emeritus of uh, Fuller Seminary, sent uh, me an email and Dr. Bacot of our Bith department as well and said, why don't we have a conversation between two iconic evangelical institutions, Wheaton College and Fuller Seminary, and invite a few of our friends and let's, let's just get together and have a conversation for three days. And I said, that sounds like an amazing idea. And so this is how we got Dr. Mao and Dr. Bentley and Dr. Perkins with us today. And hang on, hang on, you're, hang on, not yet, not yet. You're gonna, in a, in a few moments, you'll be able to give them a rousing Wheaton welcome. But I wanna, I wanna give you just a, a few moments of introduction because I know that uh, 600 of you are brand new on her campus and some of you may not know. So Dr. Perkins, uh, born in 1930 in Mendenhall, Mississippi, has been a civil rights activist and theologian and author and community organizer. I mean, the list, it's, it's, he is truly one of the giants in our land. And it is a tremendous privilege to have uh, him with us today as one of the premier black evangelicals in the country. There will be a day when you will tell your great grandchildren that you sat in chapel with Dr. John Perkins. Let's give it up for John Perkins. And on my right is uh, Dr. Ruth Bentley, and she is uh, no stranger to Wheaton. Uh, she went to school here, and she was on our board of trustees, so she is a trustee emerita. 
and uh, together with her husband were deeply influential in beginning the, the National Association of Black Evangelicals and has been a, a force, a leader. And so it is a privilege to have Dr. Ruth Bentley with us. And on my uh, far right is a dear friend of mine, Dr. Rich Mao, uh, President Emeritus of Fuller Seminary, and has been a towering theologian, has been a, uh, a voice for ecumenism, interfaith dialogue, and providing a civil discourse among evangelicals and interfaith dialogue as well, and has been a dear friend and initially a mentor in print to me, but in these last few years, it's been a tremendous privilege to get to know him better in person, Dr. Rich Mao. Our, our three days together are actually sponsored not only by Wheaton College, but also by Fuller Seminary. And uh, many of our students and staff these next few days will have an opportunity not only to interact with these guests, but there are several more that have come from Fuller Seminary. And they are seated on the left-hand side. If you would stand, if you were here from Fuller. And we have with us September Penn, Dwight Radcliffe, Dominique Robinson Coleman, Tracy Stringer, Patrick Wallace, Sean Watkins, Latina Williams, Dr. Marcia Clark, and Janelle Austin from Fuller Seminary. Let's give them a welcome. And, and I'm, I'm a little giddy with excitement, but they're here just to come talk, just to be together, to be with you, to get to know us, to get to know each other, and to have dialogue and conversation about what it means to be an evangelical, what it be, means to be a person of color in America today. But before we, we listen to Dr. Perkins' story, uh, I want us to pay attention to our reading for today, which providentially is taken from... Uh, the book of Esther, the second chapter. And as you know, the book of Esther is the story about the people of God uh, during a time of Holocaust, during a time of tremendous evil. And God raises up a man and a woman and uses them to bring life and redemption and salvation to the people of God. And I'm reading from chapter 2 in the hope and with the fervent prayer that God would raise up men and women for such a time as this. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel in custody of Hegai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Hegai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Everything written about Jesus in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Amen.
we are witnesses of these things. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this book of Esther. And even though there is no mention of your name, even though your name is not verbalized or vocalized, you are present. And even in the midst of a scourge of evil against your people, God, your redeeming and sovereign love is always working behind the scenes. And now in 2017, in America, we face another scourge of evil that is wicked, a belief system that puts one race over against all the others, the plight of systemic racial injustice is all around us. It is woven through the fabric of our very country. But we pray now that for such a time as this, you would raise up young men and women at Wheaton College and at Fuller Seminary to bear witness to the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and to embody his love in everything they do and say. We dedicate these next three days to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today we will begin with listening to Dr. Perkins' story. And uh, I don't know how many of you know him, so I want to uh, just begin by uh, having him introduce himself. Tell us a little bit about your background, about where you grew up, what was it like, and maybe what were some of the, the gifts you received growing up and what were some of the challenges you faced when you were a young man in Mississippi? I'm going to let you ask that question again. But being here at Wheaton at this time in my life and the contribution, I won't go into details, that Wheaton College has uh, made in my own life, that was, and of course, I think the greatest contribution that one can make with another one is to become friends. And then them honoring me here uh, opened many doors, and I just want to thank you. And I'm learning the, uh, the theology of gratitude. And I think that should be a big part of redemption. We love him because he first loved us. And friendship is an absolute gift from one person to another. Many times, the one that received the gift had very little to do with the, the gift. So I just want to, to say that and feel like I'm coming home when I'm here and thank you publicly and for doing for that. Now I'm ready for the question now again. Are you ready for the question? Well, clearly, Dr. Perkins, there's been many uh, churches and colleges and universities that would love to claim you as their own, but you're our special friend and you belong to Wheaton as far as we're concerned. I'm pr I, think, I think Wheaton was the first college to give you an honorary doctorate, is that right? Uh, probably, probably not only that, probably was the first black. I'm not quite certain of that. Right. And so I think it was, a, it was a very crucial time in the history of our nation and I'm grateful. Well, you belong to us, and so we're eager to hear a little bit about your, uh, about your story. Tell us about your, your background, your upbringing. Yeah. Uh, yes. I guess I have learned based on my experience, based on the times in which I was born. Uh, I was born in 1930, and my mother died when I was seven months old. We were sharecroppers. The sharecroppers was the extension that uh, came in after the emancipation when they freed all of those blacks without any land. And so we were still, the earth is the Lord and the full thereof. And really, biblical understanding of God is to know who owned the earth. And being a slave, a sub slave, is about the most hideous thing you can do because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. I think you need to know that. This is not just an accident. This is economic exploitation 
at its absolutely evilest place that it can be in the world. Uh, so I grew up during that sharecropping period. I grew up doing in, in that, I grew up in the Depression, the greatest hardship uh, this country has ever known. My mother died of a disease on her birth death certificate. It's called polygar. That's the way they announce people who died from nutrition deficiency. My mother died of starvation. Uh, I, 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 you got to know that. You got to know that, and especially to understand, as I look back, my own action, a little bit different from most others, because I grew up in this poverty uh, in life. Uh, first thing I can remember, because my father dropped us off, the five of us off at his mother's house, and my grandmother had been the mother of 19 children, and I knew 13 of those, my uncles and aunts. And here we were, sharecroppers, on this place of plantation there. And one of the first things I can remember is that um, your mother's dead. My, we were not Christian. We didn't come from a Christian background, and we were like so many of those who would have been, you would call them drug houses today. Uh, they were many of those who would have been in, uh, families that would have been in prison. So uh, we didn't have the moral uh, understanding of the biblical Bible. And there was it framework and its impact within the community, but we didn't participate in it personally. We knew that I should not kill, that I should not steal, and those kind of things. And, and of course, that was another slave system because the prison system became another forced labor pre, pre, time when you would change those people to take them out to work and many times keep them chained depending on what kind of work they were doing all day. So I grew up in the midst of that system, in the midst of the, in the, midst of the depression of that system. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think that helped to shape me. It, it shaped me a little different uh, uh, in growing up because, and I said it sort of like if I ever amount to anything, I, I want to do something about the suffering of the people. Not, not only they need to be free, number one, no doubt about that, but there is a need for them to participate in the economics of the society in which they live. And so uh, I think it's that longing, I think what would happen in the community. While my aunt and others had other children, and it, our family would have reflected the statistics of today because most of my cousins were born out of wedlock, you, you know, and I'm sure that I would, uh, and, and we all grew up together in that house. And I'm sure I probably was, was, was crying and saying, Mama, and, uh, and they would tell me, your mother's dead. No mother's dead. I, I think it set the framework uh, for a longing that I had in life to be accepted, to be loved in life. And, and so that's, I remember that. The, the, one of the memories of my father coming to see me, he dropped us off there. My grandmother gave away three of the kids, the five. She kept my oldest brother because he could work on a plantation. She kept me because I was the baby. She gave the others away to other members of the family in, uh, in life. One of the memories I can rem remember when my father came, the first time I can remember seeing him, I must have been about uh, two or three years or whatever the age you can remember in that time. And I remember him coming back to the bed to where I was in the house and picked me up and carried me back up by, by the fireplace. And he called me baby. I heard something, I never, I was too big to be a baby. But, but I heard love. Next day he went back to where he was 
because he got another wife, and she didn't want us five babies, you know. And, uh, and my father couldn't read or write uh, in, in life. And, uh, and, and, and so I grew up in that kind of a, uh, environment. I think one of the things that shaped my life when I began to be um, educated, I dropped out of school somewhere between the third and the fifth grade, and I never went back to school. But, but I began to be educated when I was a boy of about 12 years old during World War II. A 12-year-old guy could get a job anywhere almost that time because all the men were gone, and we were still living on a plantation. And this was a big plantation, so there was a, a, quite a bit of freedom if you was on the right side of the plantation. So we had been, and I worked, I was away from home, and I needed some uh, money to show to the kids back home, people was going to Chicago, where their mother was, the great migrant was on, people me leaving the South, going North. They would come back every once in a while in the summer on vacation. And they would always bring us a gift or something that was special to show us that. And so I got a little bit here. It went about 15 miles away from home. Of course, I was going to lie and tell the kids I went farther. But, uh, and I needed a job. I needed a job to buy something to prove to the kids that I'd been away. Because they would have just said, you just been somewhere. And so we went into a little, little town. Uh, and there was hard people there. And uh, men got, asked us to come work for them for a day to haul hay. I was anxious to do it because I wanted to show the kid there that proved to the kids that I'd been away. And, uh, and we got the job hauling hay. I expected to get about a dollar, a dollar and a half for that day's work. That was a going work label for a sort of a world day's work back in Mississippi in that time. And so we worked hard that day. Um, I, I expect to get about a dollar, dollar and a half for that day's work. And at the end of the day, this man gave me 15 cents. He invited us back to the kitchen. We couldn't go through the front door. You, blacks always had to go into the back of a house, a white man's house. And we went there, and at the end of the day, and he gave me and the other man a dime and a buffalo nickel. Now, I hadn't known anything about exploitation. I didn't know anything about that. But I, right away, I knew right and wrong. And that man I asked the question, how were you able to do this to me? That was the beginning of my, and that's the beginning of any education. Ask the question that has to do with your own dignity and progress. You can't ask the best of it, and children will ask questions. How did this man was able to take advantage of me, exploit me? I looked around, and I began to see, understand what exploitation was. This man had the mules, he had the wagon, he had the hay, and he had the field. All I had was my needs and my wants, and didn't have the freedom to achieve that. They call that a capitalistic system. What he had was, I'm not condemning it at this level. I'm explaining it. I'm explaining it. Uh, maximize profit. You can't over... Uh, slavery is the ultimate of maximizing profit. I, said, I see how this system works. If I'm going to succeed in this society, I've got to get the means of production. I've got to get the mules, the wagon, the hay, and the field, which is more important. I've got to get my values under my own control. I, my blagues cannot just be a value of showing my worth. My values must be anchored within the socioeconomic system in a way I can have the abundant life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And I said, 
And so that motivated me. I began to learn the principles of economics in life. Fast forward, my brother went into the service. He was in the service, came out of service, and was home about six months. Going to fight Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich, where he was going to enslave the whole world over a supremacy of German people. My brother went there and fought for that and came home. Six months later, he was killed by whites in my hometown. And that's when I left Mississippi. And I went to California. New opportunities, there was racism there, but it was of a new kind because the need for laborers was so severe when I went there. After World War II, California was busting at the scene. And so I got opportunities, ended up then going into the Korean War and spent my time in Korea and came back. New opportunities, really, uh, there. And then, of course, back in the South, the civil rights movement by this time is beginning, especially when I went into service and came out. I want to ask you a quick question here. So you mentioned growing up that you were not a family that went to church. Right. So at what point do you remember discovering the good news of Jesus Christ yeah, I, I and think, started going to church, became yeah, a disciple? I think, I think I had heard it probably at funerals. I think I had heard it when they, we, I went to the church for some incident. Uh, but it was, it was highly emotional, but not putting those principles in practice. And so it was a little bit like an entertainment center. I didn't know about God, I didn't know about virtue, so I'm not being overcritical. I'm just sharing the idea. So I didn't, I didn't hear the gospel. But it wasn't until I had went into service, came out of service, and a group of people, they called them child evangelism. It was a new movement in the world. Children. They would get children in the church, I mean, in the community, and they would tell them Bible stories. So I went to California, and of course, I, uh, my wife always get at me about that when I be too hard on my own kids about work and all of that. She always say, um, uh, you almost became successful. <laughs> she said. So uh, a lot of good things happened to me. Thought in my family, got my big house <laughs> and, and car. And then my son, they began to pick my son up to go to the good news club. They, they walk him to the good news club. And it was there in his good news club. It was a church, it's near here. It's still in existence. The, the, it was called the Protestant Catholic Church in Zion, Illinois. There was a church on the corner that had the good news club. And it was these, this was unique too, because these black and white people. See, I never believed that it was okay to accept segregation. I did not think even, probably before I was born, but before I can remember that, that God is a bigot. <laughs> Just my conversion. I began to go to this, my son began to go to this class, and uh, they began to teach him. And I could see something, value, that he, didn't, he had was different from mine. Mine was pretty selfish, pretty direct, pretty trying to pull out of the poverty that I was in. Uh, my son was, would almost be considered almost middle class, you know, by then. But he was coming home and he was saying things that I never heard before. He'd be singing songs like, God loves the little children, all the children of the world, brown and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. God loves all the children of the world. But in Mississippi, where I came from, the governor was standing in the door, blocking little black children from coming. They was Christian people. 
These were Christian people. And I'm hearing something different. They must not have sung that kind of song in the white churches down there. <laughs> you, it, and, 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 and so I, I, uh, I went, and then I went to a little Church of Christ Holiness Church, and it had white people in it, small amount. So it wasn't, I then put a lot of my racism in the South. And then Emmett Till was killed. Then Rosa Parks was put in jail in the consciousness. It was out of that then I went to this little church. This is a little holiness church now. And uh, it was there I came to know Jesus Christ. Now, I think it was the leading. It started back here where the gospel was being preached. And my son was reproducing that gospel that he was hearing in my life. And the verse of scripture that really put it together in my head, two verses of scripture, keep two memories. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I read, I heard, the, book, the little epistle of Galatians 2.20, where the gospel was put into one, the, almost the totality of the gospel is in that one verse, probably closer than any other scripture in the Bible, sort of a wholeness of the gospel, that message y'all are talking about, that, that, that comprehensive view of life the total redemption from slavery and freedom. And now you can make a choice in life. And it went something like this. I have been crucified, Paul given his testimony. And the subject here is racism and different based on circumcision. It, that book is talking about what divides us that's called another gospel. That's right. Racism is called another gospel. Racism is called another gospel. Peter, you don't walk after us. When you discriminate against the people you are taking care of you, when your other buddies, that's another gospel. So when I came to cry, I tried to want to fill those holes in the gospel. The word that it was redemptive. It was the forgiving of sin. It's not just knowing what's right and wrong, but asking for forgiveness for your wrong. That's a great invitation. That's good news. When you discover that you're a sinner, that's the best news in the world. And the best solution to that is ask the Savior to forgive you. And that's what we don't have. We don't lost the forgiven grace of God. But we got an opportune time. Oh, I'm preaching it. <laughs> right. and, and so I, it, was, it was doing what was going on when I was converted would go on my converted and my discipleship. And let me say this for in relation. Uh, a, a man who was a scholar, uh, white gentleman, I started going to his teacher's class where he was teaching teachers how to teach child evangelism. And that child would go to where I heard the gospel. And, uh, and he discipled me. Uh, just a little deal here. We got so many things wrong in our church that we got to make it right. Christian, Christian is a behavior. They call them Christian first when they behave like Christian, interracial at any hour. That's when they call them Christian. We call them Christians when they make a decision. Discipleship is to make you a Christian. So you can be behaved. He sent us into the world to get them to come to know him 
and then to be decipher them in those virtues that makes us Christian. We call them Christian without deciphering them. Boy, that ain't that it. You're supposed to know they're Christian by their love. You should know they're Christian because they got these divine virtues. Love, joy, pressure. These are divine virtues. These are divine virtues of every Christian. Every Christian have an aptitude to do that, to have these divine virtues in you as a Christian. And like, well, I'm preaching again. No, it's all right. Yeah. I want to yeah. ask one. So you, you use the word Christian. You've not yet used the word evangelical, which is a word that is heavily debated to these days, of course, based on the Greek word for the good news. Can you tell us a little bit about what that word means to you? And I'm going to invite, with the few minutes that we have left, Dr. Mao and Dr. Bentley, if you have any questions that you think Dr. Perkins should a answer this morning briefly, then, um, briefly. then we'll get a chance to do that. <laughs> but... Tell, tell us briefly, what, what, do you, what is that word? I mean, you talk about good news. Uh -huh. What does that word evangelical mean to you as a black man? Well, I sort of live to see the shaping of evangelicalism. And it came really before and after World War II. And I saw evangelicalism shaped as an entity in the world. It wasn't there before. It came out of what we would have called fundamentalism in the society. So I watched it. But uh, I got mine, evangelical, I got it from a discipleship, okay? An evangelical disciple. You, you know, I, I got it from that. That's one thing. But I got it really from, I had to define it from the Bible. And I get it from probably the most important passage in the scripture in the most explained, solid passage in the scripture. That's chapter, that's Luke chapter two. When the angel, evangelical beings, one of them came to the shepherds and said the whole gospel. He said, behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. All people. I heard that. I didn't hear no bigotry in that. Behold, I bring. And then the rest of that church, and then they shepherd. When they went there and obeyed the word and found it as God has said it, they took it to the mountain. The evangelical host of heaven came out saying, good news, good news. So I get it from the, from the scripture that it's the mission of the mission is to know God and make him known. To know God, make him known, worship him because of that forever and eternity. Th that's to me is an evangelical. And there ain't no room in there for, that's what makes the crisis we're in right now. Crisis of itself because it has been able to identify itself. And the thing that I've said here is not a part of that identity. If somebody become a Christian yesterday, a few years, and become the president, and have never been a cipher, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I'm, no, 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 what are you talking about? I just said, being a disciple, he said, go into all the world and disciple the people. Tell them what I came to do. Tell them to observe what I did when I was here on earth. That makes you a Christian. And that come out of discipleship. That's simple. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, e either Dr. Mao or Dr. Bentley, do you have a question that you want Dr. Dr. Perkins to answer before we close in prayer? 
This won't let him preach, though. Okay. <laughs> He's already done that. He's done. He's <laughs> preached. Um, I just wanted you to get back to your life during the civil rights movement. You, you mentioned it, but you didn't say much about it. You know, it, I know you had some experiences as in that. You know, you want to share that? Yeah, the show is a show I intended to do that. But I guess my almost, and I hear you, Almost when people ask me, when did I join the civil rights movement, it's almost too ignorant a question for me to answer, based on what I've already said, based on the fact of my mother dying of starvation on a plantation, my brother fighting for, against Hitler and coming down, and then somebody say, when did you join the civil rights movement? Lord have mercy, uh, I was waiting on it. I was born longing for it. What are you talking about? So I think what asking, the question asking, you would probably want to ask. I'm asking what happened to you during that oh, yeah, period. I know, I, I know the question. You know, what, know, the you question. know what I'm asking. I, know the <laughs> I, need to, I need to say that to these students, not even talk to you. Uh, I, I think the defining moment there are, there are certain defining moments in everybody's life. And those are defining moments when you make a decision to commit your life to something. To get married, that's a defining moment. There are certain times you make that decision that define your existence. Uh, I think it happened on the floor of the Brandon Jail in 1970, uh, February 7th, when we went to jail to bond out 19 students, and the three of us went to jail, and we were locked in jail as the leaders of the group, and we was tortured. I think it was in that night, and y'all don't know what torture is. Torture is to bring you as near death, but don't kill you. And as you're tortured, it's, it's evil. Because to judge a person based on torture is evil. Because three things happen to you when you're tortured. You tell a lie. Uh, you will tell the truth. And you will say whatever the torturers want you to say. So the torture is wrong. Because they torture you in a way that if you say what they want you to say, they're going to free you. You're already dying. And so in that jail, I saw the, the ugliness of racism. I saw it on the face of those white policemen. That looked like to me they was in a tub and it was nothing but maggots in it. Then I began to think about what could I have? What could I do? And I thought about if I had a hand grenade with atomic energy in it, I would pull it, and we'd all been killed. I saw that I, my reaction to that action would have been worse. I saw that we were broken. I don't think white folks have no advantage in humanity. I don't think we have an advantage in humanity. I think we're all like sheep have gone astray. I saw a holocaust because we had believed what Martin Luther King had told us. I want to live in a land where my grandchildren will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I saw a holocaust when people done decided to die for their cause. It's a pretty tough test situation. I just saw it, and I said, God, if you get me out of this jail tonight, I, I know I was bargaining with God. I know I was making bargain. I think he listened. I think he heard me. He brought me out of that jail. And I said, I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my economic interest. I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my racial interest. I want to preach a gospel of redemption. And I found that in the scripture we did this morning. Uh, that Romans passage there, 
That's the story of redemption. And that can redeem all of those, black, white, Jew, and Gentile. And we need to live that out within the congregation. We need to live that out within the congregation. That was a turning point in, uh, in my life. And yeah, that's what you want to hear. We're going to, so, so tomorrow morning, there's more where this came from. Uh, we meet again for chapel tomorrow. I'm going to ask Ray Chang to come up. He's going to pray. Will you thank Dr. Perkins this morning? bow your heads in prayer with me. Our Father who sees all things, knows all things, sustains all things, in whose hands we live and move and have our being, we thank you for your unending patience with us. We thank you for the ways in which you have sustained your grace to us, though we are undeserving of it in every way. We thank you for your endless faithfulness in our lives, even though we've been unfaithful to you. We thank you that you see our struggles and our needs and that you give us the measure of grace we need for each and every day. Above all, we thank you for the good news of great joy that is available to each and every person in Christ Jesus. Lord, would you forgive us of our sins against those we have dehumanized, trampled on, and used for our own gain. Forgive us for not upholding the Imago Dei in all your people. Forgive us for the ways in which we have divided what you have intended to be united. Forgive us for treating people differently based on the color of their skin and for the ways we have treated our brothers and sisters in Christ as lesser beings simply because of our economic interests, our preferences, our political idolatry, and our misguided theology that was clearly not rooted in your word. Forgive us for the subtle and not so subtle ways that, that racism and white supremacy continues to infect your church, the bride of Christ. Lord, would you show us how we must repent of the past, show us how we can move forward, Show us how we can serve those who we've exploited. Show us how we can embrace those we've excluded. Show us how we can give up for the sake of those we've kept down. Show us a vision for your church that we can live into based on your revealed word to us and make us like you in every way by adopting the mind of Christ and by living out through our life and our actions all that you call us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.